Are you ready to manage your work and personal world better to live a fulfilling, productive life? Then you've come to the right place. Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity. Here are your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud with Francis Wade and Art Gelwix. Welcome everybody to Productivity Cast, episode 029, episode 29, inbox zero, inbox one, and processing email messages. We are going to be talking about the all encompassing inbox and how to deal with your inbox. And so I wanted to lead off because as we discussed email in the last episode, email management of multiple um, accounts has its positives and negatives. All of us, Augusto, Art, Francis, and I have multiple email accounts. And to be honest, I don't know how many people who have only one single solitary email account. But whether you have one inbox or 10 inboxes, one methodology that's cropped up over the past decade is the idea of inbox zero. It came from Merlin Mann, who did a Google Tech Talk uh, back in 2007. And I will put a link to that in the show notes if those of you who want to watch, I believe it's about an hour or so, uh, he talks about this idea of inbox zero. So in this cast, we're going to discuss a little bit about inbox zero, its pros and cons, some related concepts that I've kind of thought about over the past couple of years, namely inbox one and the tab zero methods. And get feedback and permutations from the Productivity Cast team. We'll close some, with some thoughts on email message processing from my esteemed colleagues. And I think this is going to be a great podcast. This is going to have a lot of really great information for us all. So let's kick it off with who wants to kind of describe in brief the concept of Inbox Zero, what Merlin Mann was really talking about as a, as a kind of... Uh, extension of getting things done by David Allen and this idea of of capturing and then processing one's inboxes. I don't know if any of us truly understand what the current definition of that is. I know what mine is and and I'm sure mine is not matching what's in the literature, but I mean the mentality of being able to get eliminate all actionable items and processing items from a common email inbox or a singular email inbox. That's, to my knowledge, that's it in a nutshell. Now, what have I missed, guys? I will add a couple of things. You know, what what Merlin Mann was talking about when he was talking about inbox zero is that David Allen talked about this idea that your task inbox should uh, really be cleared out every 24 to 48 hours. And I don't actually know what David Allen was specifically thinking, but I have tended to think about that from the perspective that he wasn't talking about necessarily your communications inboxes, that is email and voicemail boxes and so on and so forth. He was really talking about your intray, the basket in which you receive your inputs, right? So whether you took uh, notes or uh, received letters or memos or whatever, that inbox was the one that I perceive him to frequently be talking about, not necessarily your email inbox, but it is another one of those in baskets as he talks about in getting things done. So I get it. My thought here is that it's really important, or let me take a step back. What I believe Merlin Mann was talking about, and and sort of the the crux of what he was talking about, was that very similar to the way that we receive mail in our home mailboxes, we receive a an influx of physical inputs, and we take those out, and we deal with them, and we don't put them back in the mailbox, right? They it's sort of a one way conveyor belt, if you want to think of it that way, that we process things and go go from there. So if we want to if we want to have a clear sort of runway in in or ground level in GTD language, we then need to then we need to then have a an ability to process or clarify those things that are coming in as inputs um, and and dealing with just the things that are new as they're coming in. The inbox is a poor place to manage inputs if we've got a whole bunch of other stuff in there that may or may not even be organized, but 
the things that come in into in should truly be new stuff coming in, not just old stuff that's been hanging around. So one of the interesting things about the time Merlin Man came with um, was this inbox zero concept was that I don't people were clear, but the message at the time from from David and I agree on that wasn't clear on well you're going to process, but he was really well you process what you can and and what his concept. There were there was two concepts that he brought that were quite interested interesting at the time. One was that inbox hero comment that that really put him in, into a famous spot for call it some way because he was he, he bring it over to say well it's not enough to to be able to process you really need to get zero and your goal need to be to process everything so you don't have everything or stuff hanging out. And the other thing that he brought uh, pretty close to that was the concept of the hipster PDA where you start having your system in paper, in index cards to be precise, um, and that's how you create the system. The problem with the paper system, is still my problem to this day as much as I would love it, is it do not allow it only allow a certain amount of input and as soon as you surpass that point you break it but the inbox zero it's still a good concept and it's a good concept that sadly for most people is unheard of you know i there is a, a on one on one of the many things i have heard david allen talking he he made a point that that is really interesting, and is that most people has never seen Inbox Hero. If you go right now and open a new email account, doesn't matter if you're going to pay for Exchange or Office 365, you're going to get corporate Google, or you just go for a free account anywhere. As soon as you open and get to that inbox, you already have to. Okay. Because you have a welcome, a set up, and so for most people, inbox zero is something that is unheard of, and because of that, they have never experienced the power who have have to look at that and have everything processed. Um, during the years, I have advised people to unplug, you know, kill the web, download your email on disconnect from the internet and then respond to that process all that you know doesn't matter the emails will go out as soon as you reconnect to the internet but it's for most people the only chance you have to actually get to zero i get you know emails at a rate that if i don't disconnect that way i will never see inbox zero and i wish to say that i'm unique on that but sadly that's not batch of originality anymore yeah, here I want to backtrack a second though, and now that my brain cells are starting to fire properly on a Monday morning, the concept of inbox zero I think starts off with a misnomer. When we say inbox zero, and I'm going back to what I read from Merlin Mann and that sort, we make the mistake of associating directly inbox with email, and that's not the case in this context. Inbox is incoming work requests, incoming information, whether it's in an email, whether it's an instant message, whether it's a paper mail you get, uh, whether it's a note for yourself you leave in the desk. If you look at how GTD works, you have, you know, Alan lays out, have a box. And if you have something to do, you write a note on it and you stick it in the box and you process that box down. So the exercise is really around the processing of incoming information, that capture me mechanism. It does not directly have to associate with inbox, with an email inbox. And I think when I was thinking about this this morning and last night, that's where I was getting a little hung up because we get so wrapped up in this. I've got to get my inbox, ergo email inbox, down to nothing in it. There is no correlation between that and being productive. There is no causality there whatsoever. Being able to handle everything that's coming in 
in whatever mechanism it's coming in and process it into your trusted system is my understanding, the core of what inbox zero truly is. It's closing those loops out and not letting stuff just sit out there in the capture stage of your process. Now, with that being said, inbox associated with email is probably the biggest culprit of stuff coming to us. But when Merlin Mann originally set this up, that would be a direct association. That would be true, but that's not the case anymore. We've got so many inputs now, whether it's email, whether it's social media, whatever. We've got to have systems that allow us to pull in multiple things and put it into a conceptual inbox. And I think what triggered it for me is I used Todoist for all my task tracking and the default box that they use, the default place for new tasks to go in is called the inbox. I I agree with you. And, and, and that's one of the things that was starting to change at that time. You know, before, before that talk, you know, we, as much as some of the technologies like text message and those things are now seems like, oh, we have had them forever. There were technologies that were not necessarily mass adopted yet when when that talk came out. And and there was other uh and there and there was the other inbox and I agree. He referred inbox zero as every inbox you have. The problem is for most people, you know, a lot of that inbox zero thing happened to be on the email. That's and and emails and text messages, uh, even more than voicemails these days. I don't, you know, I don't get at least for me, I don't get as many voicemails as I get text and uh, emails. But if you don't know how to process all those, what you leave is a bunch of stuff hanging around that it will make impossible that it will make impossible to accomplish that inbox zero that at the same time make impossible to accomplish having any kind of control over anything. So I, I think there are arguments on both sides of the of the aisle for inbox zero. I, I'm I'm gonna place a link to a, an interesting article from the next web that talks about the kind of anti inbox zero sentiment that has kind of grown up over time you know even Elon Musk has has said uh, inbox zero is 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 a fad is this kind of trend um, akin to um, I forget what he what he likened it to but he you know he's kind of likened it to some something um, you know of 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 a contemporary sort of fad that we have today. And, and I, I, again, I, I go back to this idea that inbox zero has value in the sense that, you know, this, we should be understanding that inputs are not where we maintain and manage actions. And therefore we should be, we should be moving things along a, a route to get to a functional managed space. And I think that's important. Again, I'm I'm going to I'm going to always lay waste to the idea that inbox 0 applies to um anything more important than your task inbox as art was talking about you know where may t maybe Todoist or other tools like remember the milk or omnifocus or otherwise they provide an inbox for your tasks that are that are or incoming potential commitments, those things that are coming in, that's way more important to process than email. However, in the context of Inbox Zero for email, I think it's um, this. This is a good time for me to sort of flesh out this idea that I've, I've been, I've been talking about and thinking about for quite some time, which is which I just have casually coined Inbox One. I'm not, I'm not partic particularly wedded to the name. Uh, but the idea here is that you have a as few inboxes as possible for input from many different sources. And because technology allows for that to be the case, we can do that. So, for example, I have uh, you know signed up with a uh, an online service that takes my mail and digitizes that and sends me 
the mail, you know, via uh, email, and just shows up in my inbox. All of my email messages all come into my my inbox, right? from many different sources so that I can see that. I've even gone to the effect of, t of having all of my text messages uh, and voicemail messages through Google Voice forwarded into my email inbox. Now remember, if I'm using my phone, I'm going to see those messages there. So in, in my system, I've filtered them to folders so they're not showing up all en masse in my inbox. I don't need to see those in my inbox. But if I'm sitting at my computer and I'm not looking at my phone, then that's where I'm going to be able to take inputs, process them, respond, and get rid of them almost instantaneously. And I'm sitting at a full keyboard. And I don't know about the rest of you gentlemen, but I tend to process much better when I have a full keyboard in front of me. And, and that doesn't matter what screen it is. I just really like having a full keyboard in front of me. So the idea of inbox one is to to you know have as many inboxes as you need, but no no more, and to have as few inboxes as possible uh, and no fewer. Uh, and and if that's if that's one inbox, that's fantastic because then you have this one place where everything is coming into. And if it's not like for me, I have a, a work you know, inbox and a personal inbox, and I filter those separately because of context, I don't think many people would do very well. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this as to whether many people would do well to have an inbox one for their entire life, both work and personal. But perhaps there are people out there who can do that. It's kind of like people who like to manage all of their productivity system in one tool, like an like a Microsoft Outlook, where they they actually manage tasks, calendar, email, and notes, and so on and so forth, all within Outlook versus having multiple applications for it. Yeah, I can see definitely doing that. I've seen and I've considered it myself. Where I personally run into a hang up is on the processing of the physical materials into the digital system by a third party. Like having my email forwarded and scanned, that just gives me the heebie-jeebies. So that's not going to happen on, on my watch for me. Uh, but those are things that I can manually process into my system. Uh, being able to, ha I think where you run into the challenge with that idea, though, is not the idea. It's the fact that you wind up with a tool that you're trying to manage everything with. And then we have, then we spend get into that death spiral of trying to find the perfect tool that will do everything that we need for that, everything that's coming into that box. And I have yet to find something like that. I found things close to it, but nothing ever is 100%. So you constantly are having to tune in and check out the next latest and greatest tool that's coming down the path. I like the idea. I use it primarily for, as I said before, for incoming emails. But even then, I don't know that it's a great idea, but it just seems really hard to implement. I can understand that. I can understand how, how one would think that it would be difficult. And, and I guess I, I did spend a considerable amount of time over the years perfecting this. You know, I, I, I didn't just start out with a Fujitsu ScanSnap IX500, you know, and, uh, and certainly many of the things that are available today weren't available when I first came up with this idea. But today, I, I, I pretty much don't have a problem. I mean, you know, like when if I want to scan something, all of my my scanners and, and devices now have the ability to send a scan to a particular place. And I just have it auto set up to email it directly into where it needs to go to, or I email it to myself. Uh, so if I scan at uh, one of my multifunction you know, printer, copy, copy, or scanner devices. That's that's already kind of an easy one. Uh, the the scanner I use is is designed to be able to direct things all automatically to where I want them to go. So if it's a receipt, it's going to go into my receipts notebook within Evernote and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a non-issue. Uh, regarding the the mail scanning, I, I I totally hear you, Art. However. The U.S. Postal Service scans everything anyway. I mean, they're looking at everything um, purely for security purposes, making sure that you know there isn't anthrax in your mail and so on and so forth. So that's kind of computerized. So uh, you know, not particularly a bad thing. But the um, 
but the service that I've been using, Earth Class Mail, um, I trust them. I, I haven't, you know, it's not like I'm reading, I'm getting anything uh, in my mail that I feel like is ultimately too private. And again, it's, you know, most of what's being done is automated. So it's not like I'm, someone's sitting around reading my Christmas letters. <laughs> One of the things I also think trips this up is the segmentation and the separation between work and personal, especially if you're working in a corporate environment, because then you don't really have the latitude to integrate the two systems together. You know, I don't want to necessarily bring <clears throat> the gear conversation but I think the gear need to be mentioned too, because one of the things that used to be different when all this Invox Zero conversation came is for most people, email at work happened at work. You know, it's, there was no, uh, you know, that that thing that we've seen today, that connectivity or that level of connectivity that we have, where most people has access to their email everywhere and their computers are going with their everywhere. It wasn't necessarily true at that time, okay? And, and even that Inbox Zero, it's not all about email. Email, it's a big factor in here, mostly because it's the biggest host most people have. The actual bigger one that people don't notice is text messages, okay? Uh, used to be email. I think now people get more input via text message, and it's even more ignored than what email was. But then comes the hardware issue. It used to be that... You know, you may get email on a home computer and you may get email at a work computer and they never necessarily mix and match. For most people these days, their main machine is their iPhone or or Android phone or mobile phone, okay? And on there, for most people, you get personal, you get text messages, you get work, and you get everything else. And that comes to the problem of how good can you manage and process all that in that device. I've been arguing over the years that people should stop checking email on their iPhone and, or their phone, mobile phone, okay? And mostly because people do not have the ability, the knowledge, or the technique to process in the same way they will do it on their machine. So what that does is you look at email on your phone, okay? You try to move fires away and then get back to your computer and then reprocess email. By the way, if your main machine is not a tablet and you are not processing email on the tablet, that works exactly the same way. In conjunction to that, people is getting on their phones you know, now they're using them as a scanners, taking pictures of the stuff they want to uh, remember, and they are getting a bunch of text messages that it is input, is part of that inbox. But in many, many, many cases, is simply super poorly processed. So, again, I did not want it to bring the hardware into, into this, but I think one of the things that was not a reality when Inbox Zero talk came out is how much hardware has changed. And the new hardware, the new accessibility of hardware has made for people even harder to reach this inbox zero, to really process, because a lot of that input now is hiding, is invisible, and it is on most people's mobile phone. Just to give context to what you're talking about, Augusto, is that the concept of Inbox Zero came out a month, or at least Merlin Mann's t uh, talk at Google came out a month after the iPhone was released. So up until that point, people did have access to email on their, on their mobile devices, but those are very, very few people 
you know, it was, I, I, I think you might agree with me, maybe you don't agree with me, but it, th- this was a probably small population of, of people who had access to email on their phones. And now today, almost everybody accesses email from their phones. Th- that's exactly my point. Yes. Before I, I, before that point, okay, email, I mean, the trios were able to get some emails, but it wasn't really effective. Okay, people who were really doing email on their phone were the BlackBerry or the CrackBerry, as, as was called at that time, the CrackBerry people. Guilty as charged. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was the CrackBerry people. But, but if you think about it, also at that time, the amount of text messages that people were receiving were really, really low. The cameras on some of those phones, and even most Blackberries did not have a camera because they were aimed off on a time where IT control a lot of the things and the cameras were a no-no. Okay, so you, even the people on the Blackberries, they could read the email, they could reply, they even maybe organize the email, but that was the only input or, or the principal, the main input they were getting at that time. Even when this talk came out, when the iPhone came out, took a little bit time to get into that crazy world of texting back and forward. It was really limited to a group of people. So it was not a mainstream problem. You know, let me remind you that at that time, if you want to say, you know, um, take a hike, you need to hit the number seven four times so you get to the letter T. Okay, it wasn't simple to send a text message. Okay. Um, Oh, I remember those days. You know, where you did 777? (laughs) One seven seven seven. Oh, I made a mistake. Delete. Okay, it wasn't simple. It was not what it is right now. Even the same thing with the email. It, you know, even the BlackBerry people. That was our, the input. I understand, but you had one element coming into that BlackBerry thing. Now, grab smartphone for most people, and you know. This everything is in there, you know. That is a scary proposition. How little people understand how much is on their mobile phones and how little security they have around it. But I think that the there's a first there's a basic sort of first principle at play here, which we kind of touched on in the last call on on having multiple inboxes. I think that when you set an inbox up, you're inviting the world to send you data. And some of that data involves triggers that then lead you to create tasks. So just from a task point of view, all these different, call them inboxes or direct messages, places you collect um, feedback on your wall on Facebook, they're all... From a task point of view, they're all performing the same function, which is that they're your interface to the outside world where people can send you anything they want. And out of the stuff that they send you, some of it triggers tasks. So the question is, how do you effectively pull all of these locations so that you can figure out the triggers from the non-triggers or the signals from the noise? And I think your concept of in- inbox one is right on the money in that we've we have all of these different places now on the internet and inboxes that some apps give us that we don't even want. Um, we have social networking, and of course, we have regular traditional email, but they all are functioning in the same way. And if we can bring them into a single location, so you know, when I first started using um, Android, an Android um, smartphone, I was really happy because I could bring on bring in many of these inboxes or locations into one and it although it couldn't i couldn't bring it into one software which i really wanted i at least had it in one physical location which was my smartphone and that could travel with me that was a huge 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 difference a huge benefit compared to what i had before which was stuff scattered on different devices so i think you're you're right on the money and they, the 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 reason you're on the money i think is because you want to bring as many potential triggers for tasks into a single location so that you can process all of them in one go. Because the, the worst thing to have is to have some location, some inbox hanging out there somewhere, which is collecting triggers 
which should be turned into tasks, but because they're remote, you're not checking them as religiously or in a disciplined a fashion or whatever it might be, which could lead to a tragedy, which means that there's some some message coming in that should trigger a task that you're not actually catching. So there's a discipline to 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 bringing all of these different locations into one. I think that's what Augusto was talking about, which is that if you can be disciplined and check all of them, then you're fine. However, most of us have a very difficult time given that they're scattered around our, our ecosystem. So we, we end up failing. Um, and then the last piece, I think, is that some people get the idea of inbox zero all mixed up and especially true today based on, on what Augusto just said, which is they think that skimming their inbox and leaving some stuff behind is the way to go. And when people are inbox zero inbox, they think it means as soon as a message comes in, I need to handle it immediately. So they 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 turn their all these different inputs into places that they need to keep checking and checking and checking and checking and checking. And the truth is they can never check enough. So their their concept of inbox zero is incorrect. The the proper concept if they can follow inbox one is that they could check all of them at one time, empty them all down to zero, and then move on to actually do the work. That's the ultimate principle. It's just that we don't quite have the software or maybe the hardware to allow us to do that discipline effectively. I think you have some really salient points there, Francis. And I and I wanted to just add on one one more thought that I had before we, we move on to processing and clarifying email messages, which is that for, for those who who are part of your job is to respond to email messages. Do not take what we're saying as one, an opportunity to shirk your role and responsibility. Uh, <laughs> the other is that this may not work for you, right? Because your concept of, of, how you transit communications is different than other people. You know, when I, when I was, I was in, uh, I used to own a title agency, and in that time frame, I had email coming in literally 24 hours a day, and so there was there was no concept of inbox zero for me because there, you know, I could get it to zero, but then immediately thereafter, there were new email messages coming in, and I actually went to the effect of, you know, uh, turning off my email account. Uh, my, I'm sorry, I turned off my internet services at one point so that I could get to zero, get some stuff done, and then turn my email back on at different points in the day because it was that kind of flow of email. Plus, it was my responsibility at that time to be highly responsive to clients. You know, we had real estate transactions happening all throughout the day, and people were depending upon us to be highly responsive. So if you need that in your work world, I totally get it. Today, I do not have that. It's very fr infrequent I have a client that needs me to drop everything and do something because of an email. If that is the case, they should have called me, right? So there's a, there's a real understanding in my world today that that's not quite the case. I can sit down, process email on, on really my schedule and make that happen. But if your world does not allow for that, understand you must do what you need to do for your job first and foremost. I had a client once who, who they were in a similar situation to the one you just described. They had about five people and they were getting email from their clients and the emails were coming in all day long and they were being copied to all of them. And as you can imagine, no one could afford to leave their inbox for unattended for more than a few minutes. So they all had all the alerts and pop-ups and you know all the things that you would expect that would tell you that you have an email coming in. And the, the, the answer turned out to be pretty simple, which was to put in a help desk format. Triage. Would someone have someone have someone or some function manage all of the incoming email, whether it's 24 seven or whatever. And that person's only job is to answer email, put them in order of, of um, preference, not preference, but put in some kind of priority. And then transmit that from one who to someone who can do something about the problem. 
Um, of course, it's an it's a, it's, a, it's not a brand new solution by any means. IT IT companies have been using it forever, but it 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 needs it needs to the principle needs to be applied to other jobs where people are receiving email in the way that you just described, and that ultimately the experts tied up be tied up answering every email unless they are the help desk. Instead, you need to put this help desk in so that you can perform triage. I would agree. I would agree. And so I'm going to turn the conversation over now to processing email messages and I'll, and I'll start off and, and then we can, and then you all can join in and give your thoughts here. So when, when it comes to processing email messages, I think there's a, there is something very uh, powerful happening and it's not necessarily a good thing, which is that people have this innate need for novelty and and that has caused email to become that little dopamine kick that we all get. And we have this sense of, of what's been coined FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. And so we consistently keep checking our email messages in the hope of something new and novel. And so what, what I've done, and, and I think uh, many others in the productivity community have talked about this before, but a really powerful processing tool I've used is that I've actually inverted, I've, I've properly sorted my email so that it shows up last at the, the, the oldest at the top of the of the inbox if that makes sense so when email, new email comes in it shows up at the bottom of my email list so that i'm processing the oldest email first and that's really helped me because as i get to inbox 0 you know throughout my day i'm or at least, you know, inbox less, you know, and again, I, I don't get to inbox zero every single day. I try to, I try to follow David Allen's principle of every 24 to 48 hours. And the idea is, is that as that email comes in, I'm not getting that sense of, oh, that new thing just popped up at the top of the list. I should deal with that first. It's, What's what's the stuff that's already there that needs to be processed in the order it was received? And to be quite honest, that's the most equitable, right? The the person who came to me first should 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 get first priority. If it truly is first priority, that's a choice I get to make. But I shouldn't I shouldn't demote something just because it came in just now, right? The the immediacy of it is not its priority. How about if it's an emergency, though? They should pick up the phone and call me. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. That's just not where emergency, you know, communications happen. Right. Now, all right. Let me jump in here real quick because there's something I I need to make sure is clear. When we say process, we correct me if I'm wrong. We are not saying that you take the email and you do everything in it and it's completely finished and put away and never touched again. Correct? Correct. Okay. Because we I, are all in agreement on that. Okay. And I think that's one of the things that causes some confusion with people when, when they think about processing emails, what is the process? I mean, I build ticketing systems like Francis was talking about and the process of that first step, that capture step is probably the most important thing that you have to define for yourself. What is the success state of something being processed? Is it done? Is it logged in another system? Is it put into a folder? You got to write those things down someplace so that you can follow that consistently. Because, and I like your idea, this, the sort and all, it wouldn't work in my inbox because mine's a mess. Um, but if you have that process mechanism and you've defined it, this is how I'm going to handle these things as they come through my process channel, my flow, then you can actually make sure this is going to work. But if you don't sit down and write that down and, and identify each type of thing that's going to be captured and how it's going to be processed, this becomes a train wreck in a hurry. Yeah, one time I, 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 it was so complex at one point that I needed to actually map out a workflow diagram for how email was to be processed for me. You know, what was going to be responded to immediately and what was going to be deferred to a next actions list for later processing, right? And I, and I think everybody has to take that, in, take that to heart. 
So I think that's a good point. Yeah, when I when I define things around the CPR process that I use, I think about each stage in this in this little game that the email is going to run through, like the Plinko machines on the Price is Right. It's going to be captured. What immediately I have to identify what that thing is that came in. Is it act? Is it a task? Is it information? Is it something needing a response? Is it a combination of those things? Then what's the process that has to happen right away? Not to fully complete it, but just to get it the heck out of the way of the priority work that has to be done. And then finally, and this is again, again, one of those key things, how is it going to be reported back to me? How am I going to be able to go find that again when I need it? I mean, when we think about the inbox, if you've got 2,000 items in your inbox and they've all been read, but they're still in there, it isn't any different than if you've got 2,000 items spread across 40 different folders in subfolders under your inbox. If you don't have a comprehensive and cohesive way to look at what's there and know that you can get the information back when you need it, you might as well have not processed it in the first place because all you did is you moved it to someplace else. You're sh you know, shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic at that point. Um, I, th I think um, Art brings up a good point, which is that when you when you have the all of your messages in one inbox, you're able to have the information and the trigger in the same place. The trigger being the reminder or the, the tracking mechanism. When you like when you like when you when you start to share the information out or put it out into folders or on your desktop or in the database somewhere, you now need to learn how to manage the trigger separately from the information because you're you're not using the fact that you have this line item in your inbox as the reminder. And I think and I think and I think people 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 are afraid, put it frankly, to follow sophisticated systems where they do zero inbox or inbox zero because they see that if I hide away this information away from my inbox, I'll also lose the trigger. In other words, I'll forget to go back and do the task. So they 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 reject they reject it or they're unable to do it or they try and they fail or they argue that it won't work or whatever it is. But all it is really is that they need to train themselves to manage the task separate from the data and not and and, and allow themselves to separate the two because as as art is implying, when you separate the two, it increases your productivity tremendous tremendous. Tremend, tremend, tremendously, it, it goes up by I don't know a factor of ten, a hundred, a thousand, but it's a huge, huge difference. And if you can have a trusted system for managing the tasks and a trusted system for managing the information, then you're good to go. You're you're maybe infinitely scalable. Who knows? Pay attention where that information is coming and understand that process that doesn't mean do that it means receive it mean understand what is what you need to do about it and then capture that somewhere that you are actually going to come back and do it and finish it and get it done okay um but also block time to do that you know one of the problems a lot of people have is not the amount of inputs they have. The amount of input is not going to change. Actually, it's going to be increasing. Okay? But most people have not built time into their daily uh, responsibilities to process that. And I understand the time change, and I understand there are days you need more or less, but you need to at least have a set block time every day to process those. That's the only way you're going to get some kind of control and some hope to get close to zero. As you said, do I get to zero every day? No. Um, do I wish? Yes. But the reality is I have time every day in my um, calendar blocked just to process email, just to process inputs, just to process my inboxes. Why? Because if I don't make that time, I will never have 
that as a priority and will never happen. So it will not be every 48, 24, 48 hours. It will be never. So make sure that you have a time where that happens. So for example, I tend to advise people to take time Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon tend to be a slow business time for most companies and most people. Then block at 3 p.m. to clean your inbox. Make it a calendar event so you remember that you're going to do that and sit at 3 p.m. and with the goal to process, to get as close as zero or at zero if possible and make it at three so that way, hey, if you are done by four or 4.30, then now you can celebrate the other half an hour instead of put it at four where you are going to be on the time you're ready to go home, you know, in the middle of that process. So buy yourself enough time to do that if you are going to do it that way. Uh, If that doesn't work, then at least try to find time every day that you block on your calendar to do that. Uh, And my advice is do not do it the first thing in the morning. It tends to work much better towards the end of the day as you are unwinding that tends towards the beginning of the day. And the reason for that is you are going to find an emergency and that is going to throw everything off. For me, I actually have four distinct times in my day that I've blocked out for processing email. And the tangent to that is that right next to that is time to actually process the task inbox, my task inbox, for email messages that are not just a read and reply style email message, right? It needs further than just, I read it, I processed it, I've made a decision, or I have the information at the tip of my tongue to be able to then type and respond to that person. I now need to put that into the task inbox because it requires further processing. I always leave more time to go to my task inbox and make sure that's processed because, again, like I said at the top of the show, it's that's more important to me than the email. The email is is communication. It's like a conversation we're having. It's not It's not the stuff I need to do. Right. And so I need to make sure that task inbox is actually that one being zeroed out is actually way more important to me. So I actually pair those two together. Uh, and, and so I, I hope that helps folks. I, I, I thank you, gentlemen, for this conversation. This has been a really great uh, topic and I think a really good show. And I think that we'll have more conversations about this concept of, of working with email in the future. So with that, Do you have a question or comment about this episode, something that we discussed in this episode, or otherwise about personal productivity? Please visit productivitycast.net forward slash contact and let us know. You can find this episode's show notes and how to subscribe at productivitycast.net forward slash 029. And if you could, please add a rating or review in iTunes to help us grow our personal productivity community of listeners. Thank you. That brings us to the close of Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity. Here's to your productive life. That's it for this Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity, with your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud, with Francis Wade and Art Gelwicks.